Good morning. Uh oh. <laughs> Good morning. There we go. Glad that you're with us this morning. Let's stand together. We're going to begin with scripture, as is our custom here. This morning it'll be from Colossians chapter 2. And I think this one would be helpful for us to read all together out loud. Um, set our minds and our hearts in focus on the cross and on the Lord's table that we'll be participating in in a little bit. By the way, if you're listening at home, go ahead and prepare whatever you might need to participate in the Lord's table with us together as a church family, even though you can't be here in person. Colossians 2, verses 13 and 14. Read them with me, would you? You were dead because of your sins, and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. To see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary. Drive my sinful men, torn and beaten, then nailed to a cross of wood. There's the power. We stand for peace. 
we'll continue thinking ahead about the cross in a moment, but for now, we'll play that and you greet each other. Good morning. You can go ahead and find your way back to your seats. I hope everyone was able to get a bulletin. That's a very helpful means of communication for us. If you're at home, you can access that actually on the website at the bottom of the page. There's a news link and the current bulletin is always listed there for you. Uh, there's some inserts in the bulletin I want to draw your attention to, an opportunity for our students to serve our families by providing child care so the parents can get a night out. That's mom and pop's night out. You do need to fill out this form or sign up on the table out there in the foyer, and it's due on February 11th, so that's next Sunday. So uh, consider your plans and take advantage of this opportunity. We're grateful for the students to serve in that way. There's also an opportunity for students to be blessed through a conference that we're bringing here to this building uh, through the live stream of it, the D3 Youth Conference. Plenty of information on this insert for that, and uh, you need to sign up for that by February 14, and then on the back of that insert are some plans for the year for our women's ministry, so take a look at that. And then uh, the Spread the Love effort is going on now in February. <laughs> Uh, so Awana is collecting 15 to 18 ounce peanut butter through an effort called Spread the Love, and they are going to be donated to the backpack program that serves underprivileged kids at Abingdon Elementary School just across the street here. And we want to welcome everyone that's here in person, that's fellowshipping online, that if you are a guest with us and we haven't had an opportunity uh, to get to know you yet, uh, just raise your arm and one of these ushers will get you some information about the church and a card that you can fill out and put in the offering plate that's out there on the foyer in the table, on the table in the foyer, and uh, then we'll be able to stay in touch with you. Please do read the rest of your bulletins um, for all the other helpful information. And I'd like to invite French Moore to come up and offer our time of prayer. Let's go to the one that loves us unconditionally. Let's pray. Greatly grateful to you, Heavenly Father, for being our creator and for uh, knowing our condition and paying the price through the Lord Jesus uh, that we might know you uh, as we live here and uh, know you eternally. Uh, we thank you for our local church. We thank you for what you've done in, in bringing us together. We thank you for starting this church uh, over 50 years ago and then bringing us together uh, to serve you here and to sharpen one another um, 
and we're thankful for the efforts uh, through discipleship to uh, to be able to spend more time uh, one-on-one and Lord we know that um, that can be difficult for a lot of us and we just pray that you would help us to take risk and realize that we don't know all the answers but we know who does and and just being able to encourage one another at the level we are uh, and um, for people to know that we care makes so much difference and Lord we thank you for the women's ministry and and uh, all the ladies that were able to come yesterday and the blessings from that and and the men's ministry and and uh, for the young people for the um, singles and the activities they're doing and encouraging one another and for Awana and and life groups and Lord we just thank you that um, that uh, your spirit is working in us and here and and Lord, we, we uh, wanted to continue to depend on you. We thank you for our elders and for our deacons and uh, servants' hearts for the deacons and, and just pray for wisdom for our elders. We thank you for uh, the emphasis that is being placed this year on, on discipleship. We thank you for the music and the chance to come and, and, and in harmony sing praise to you. And Lord, we just pray that we would all open our mouths whether we feel like we can sing or not, and, and uh, sing to you uh, our gratitude for what you've done for us and how you've carried us through this last week, how you've answered prayer uh, on behalf of those that had uh, uh, surgery this week. And, and uh, we pray for David as he fa- faces surgery next week and just help um, him with his pain. And I and, uh, just thank you for uh, how you are carrying him through this and help us to just continue to lift him up in prayer and we uh, pray for those that have lost loved ones and and we thank you for this service we thank you for uh, first, first Corinthians 13 and uh, uh, the chapter on love and Lord we uh, thank you that you are the author of that and pray that we can live that out in our family relationships and our church relationships and our business relationships and our community relationships and and uh, Thank you for Jason and as he faithfully teaches your word. And we thank you for the efforts of the Sunday school teachers to, to study and to, to uh, present your word. And, and we, uh, we're, we're thankful for our missionaries and uh, for the hard places you've placed a lot of them. And, and we uh, just pray for your spirit to, to uh, encourage them and pray that we might encourage them with with text and, and uh, just lifting them up in prayer. We thank you for Fauzi and Linda and their faithfulness to you for so many years and that you've strategically placed them in Jerusalem. And uh, we just pray for the contacts they have there. We pray for all those that are suffering in that region and we just pray that uh, there would be a resolution uh, to that conflict and, and uh, that uh, uh, people would would look to you for answers, and and uh, that that we could we could see a, a change in the current situation. Uh, we thank you for communion this morning, and thank you for preparation for that, mainly in our hearts. And and uh, we uh, just thank you for uh, this chance to to uh, uh, to know that that we know you, and and to uh, to. Uh, to just recommit uh, our lives and, and our testimonies to the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand again, if you would, to sing, if you're able. Matthew 27, 22 through 25. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? And the crowds said to him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more saying, let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but that rather a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, you see to it. And all the people answered and said, his blood be on us and on our children. In one sense, the blood of Christ is on all of us. In one sense, it's either on us 
as an evidence of our guilt before a holy God, it shows the cost of our sin in its fullest. It's on us as an evidence of guilt. Or the second option, and I hope this is true of you this morning, it's on us as a covering, an atonement, a payment for our sins, and a means of forgiveness between us and our Holy Father. I hope it's the second. If it's not, think about that. Let the Holy Spirit turn those thoughts in your minds as we sing this morning. Beneath the cross of Jesus I gladly take my stand The shadow of a mighty rock Within a weary land A home within the wilderness A rest upon the way From the burning of relentless heat and the burden of the day. I will glory in nothing else and delight in no other but the wonders of redeeming love beneath the cross. Upon the cross of Jesus, my eye at times can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me, and from my broken heart with tears to wonders I confess, the wonders of redeeming love. And of my unworthiness I will glory in nothing else And delight in no other But the wonders of redeeming love Beneath the cross I take across thy shadow For my abiding place I ask no other sunshine Than the sunshine of this face Content to let this world go by To know no gain nor loss My sinful self, my only shame and my glory on the cross I will glory in nothing else And delight in no other But the wonders of redeeming love I will glory in nothing else And delight in no other But the wonders of redeeming love As we approach the Lord's Supper, examine your hearts and ask yourself, am I living in a way that matches the gospel, the gift of salvation that's been given to me? And if not, then deal with it between you and the Lord while we sing. judge here is my heart what can I say to you where could I run how could I hide darkness is day to you the heart of a man 
is amazing within. So come light the way, illuminate sin. Nothing's concealed, all is revealed. Jesus, I yield to you. Judge of the secrets of the hearts of men. Here I surrender and humbly repent. You've conquered my soul, now I'll be its defense. Judge of the secrets of the heart. Was condemned under your law, rightly I stood accused. I felt my need, my conscience agreed, I was without excuse. So, how can I judge the ones who fall? I know in my heart I'm just like them all. I will confess my righteousness, Jesus must rest in you. Judge of the secrets of the hearts of men, here I surrender and humbly soul, now I'll be its defense, judge of the secrets of the hearts of men. Judge, here is my heart. What can I say to you? I will not run, I will not hide. I know I'm safe with you. you'll be serving communion, please go ahead and make your way out to the foyer so you can prepare for that. Listen to these words from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 11, uh, 14 through 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may find, receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We're able to draw near to God's throne. We're able to receive that grace that's been available to us because Christ is not only our high priest, but he's also our sacrifice. The sacrifice that was slain in order for our sins to be forgiven. One perfect human who in a very real physical body completely carried out the demands of the law 
and yet was sacrificed for, so the sins of all humans might be forgiven as Christ was nailed to the cross and hung there dying. And the wrath that we deserve for our sin was placed on Christ. And through faith in him, we're able to have Christ's righteousness. Remember, he's the high priest who sympathizes with us in our weaknesses, but was without sin. If you are here this morning and you know Christ as your Savior, you're confident he intercedes for you as that high priest, that he was the sacrifice necessary in order for you to be reconciled to God, then we welcome you to come and partake with us as we remember his sacrifice. The bread represents Christ's body that was given for us on the cross. The cup reminds us of Christ's blood that was poured out so that we could have forgiveness of sins. Would the communion servers go ahead and please come forward? Let's pray together. Jesus, you are that Lamb of God that was slain in fulfillment of all of the Old Testament lambs that were offered, that were unable to take care of the reality of our sin, but only covered over it for that time period. But we're so grateful that you came to be the ultimate sacrifice that when we place our faith in you, believing that you died on the cross to bear the punishment for our sins and then rose from the dead, that we can have eternal life, not because we deserve it, but because you, in your love and your grace, did what was necessary to appease the wrath of God the Father. We're so grateful for your sacrifice on our behalf. And that you are the great high priest that now in bodily form reigns at God's right hand. Uh, we're grateful that we can use this time to remember. And so as we hold the bread and we taste it and we smell it and we see it, these very physical human senses, may this cause us to be deeply grateful for your sacrifice on our behalf point out areas of our lives which we are yet to surrender to you and help us to come even more so in conformity with your will. We pray in your name. Amen.
account from Matthew 26 and verse 26. Now, as Jesus and his disciples were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Let's partake together. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, at great cost to yourself, you are willing to send your one and only Son into this world to be that sacrifice that gave his all um, out of obedience to your will and out of love for us. We're so grateful that through his blood shed for us, we have forgiveness of sins. We are clothed in Christ's righteousness. Instead of being enemies, we are now reconciled to you, and we have the incredible privilege of being your sons and daughters. I pray that we would always be grateful for that status we do not deserve, but that we would live that out each day, that we would live as those that have been purified from our sin and that are your cherished children. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.
Jesus took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's partake. What we've just partaken of reminds us of what Christ has done for us, but it also helps us look forward to when we will be able to join with Christ and partake of a great feast that is coming. Uh, We'll talk more about that during the time of our message today, uh, the resurrection. Would you stand with me, if you're able, one last time before the sermon? See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love. we begin our time in God's Word this morning, I'd, I'd like you to think about a time in which you were excited about something that you were able to do with your body. Maybe you played really hard on a ball team and you helped that team win the game. Maybe it was a different individual sports competition of sorts. Perhaps uh, you were able to experience a an amazing, gorgeous setting of God's world that he created because you were able to hike up a mountain or you were traversing that mountain on a ski slope. Perhaps you're able to use your voice and your body for singing or for acting or you created a work of art that you were especially proud of. 
Maybe, ladies, you remember the way you looked when you were all dolled up to, to go out someplace fancy or, or on your wedding day. Maybe, lay, men, you can remember a time when you broke a personal record and the number of reps you were lifting and a certain amount of weight. Whatever it was, something that comes to mind that filled you with delight regarding your physical body. Now, take that thought and tuck it away in your mind. We're going to come back to that a little bit later this morning. You know, there's something very distinctive about what the Bible says regarding the human body. As a part of God's original design for us humans, the Bible says that God created our bodies to be very good. And that, yes, when we die, we are separated from our bodies. The Apostle Paul wrote that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But the Bible also says that being absent from the body is a temporary state. It says that when Christ returns, the bodies of all believers who have previously passed away will be reconstituted and their bodies and souls will be united once more and that the bodies of those who are living at the time of Christ's return will be transformed in an instant, into glorified bodies that are no longer prone to sickness or decay of any kind. And that's the way believers will remain forever. Physical bodies and immaterial souls united. This is what the Apostle Paul refers to in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15-18, when he writes, For this we declare to you by word of the Lord. That we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Sadly, this is something I don't remember ever having learned about when I was growing up. In all my years faithfully attending church and Sunday school and catechism classes and VBS and Christian summer camps and Christian school and in my personal devotions, I don't remember ever hearing this teaching. And so when I was an adult and I finally came to understand this, I was pretty upset that nobody had ever taught me about that before, that I had a very, misconcept- a very bad misconception about what took place after we die. Well, I'm glad that we're going to cover these things today and next week because perhaps I can keep that from happening to some of you. The fact is the resurrection of Christ's body and the resurrection of the physical bodies of all believers is a central teaching of the Christian faith. It's that important. Why? Well, in a moment, we're going to look at the first half of 1 Corinthians 15, so you can go ahead and turn there in your Bibles, and that chapter does certainly say a lot about the resurrection, but Paul doesn't really answer the question, why isn't the immortality of the immaterial soul enough? Why is it important that in the future the physical bodies of those who died in Christ will be glorified? And their souls will be united with their bodies once again. Uh, he, does, he assumes the Corinthians at this point know the answer to that question. But I want to make sure we all understand that here today. In, in view of what the Bible says about the big picture of God's plan of redemption. Let me summarize that. Genesis 1 says that God created the, the material world in, including human bodies. And in Genesis 1 and 2, we see that description, and God says that it was very good. And we humans were intended to live in bodily form 
in a material world. Fast forward to the last book of the Bible. In Revelation 21 and 22, we see a description of God's ultimate recreation of a new heavens and a new earth. And it's clear from the description in those chapters that this new heaven and this new earth are material places. And so what we find is that God's purpose in creating a material world and material physical bodies for those who are created in his image will not ultimately be thwarted. And what this means is that anything less than a full bodily resurrection and full recreation of the created order might still give believers an enjoyable experience, but it would not provide vindication for God against Satan who brought sin into the world, which distorted God's perfect design. And it would not provide absolute perfection that God intends for his people. If there is no new creation, or if the new creation isn't material, in form as God originally designed it, then that new creation would be less than perfect because it wouldn't be how God originally created things. It would not be the restoration of all things as Peter proclaimed is coming in Acts 3.21. Now, The dominant thought of the culture of Paul's day certainly did not include an understanding of an eternal existence that was physical and material. And unfortunately, neither does the teaching of our culture today. And unfortunately, as I've attested from personal experience, some lifelong churchgoers don't really understand the eternal state as a physical existence. Bible scholar Craig Blomberg says it this way, too many pew sitters in contemporary conservative churches think of and represent heaven as an airy, fairy, ethereal kind of existence in which they do not really look forward to. The biblical hope is for believers to experience all the wonders and glories of a fully recreated heavens and earth. We will not sit on our private clouds with wings and harps periodically to dispel our eternal boredom. The new earth is bustling with activity as the new Jerusalem is its center. Now, as we turn our thoughts to 1 Corinthians 15, in verse 12, we see the reason that Paul feels he had to address this topic in his letter. It says, Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Some in the church in Corinth were denying that anyone was resurrected from the dead, including Jesus. And that's why Paul writes about what he does in this chapter. If you're able, please stand with me as I read verses 1 through 11 of 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to cover the first 34 verses today, but we'll begin with verses 1 through 11. You can follow along with your, me and your Bibles. In these verses, we see that Christ certainly rose from the dead. Now, brothers, I would remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, 
because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. You may be seated. Let's take a look back at verses 1 and 2. They provide an introduction to Paul's teaching on the resurrection. Here Paul says that in a moment he's going to remind his readers of what they believed when they first became Christians. And, and Paul asserts that it is only in continuing to believe in a bodily resurrected Jesus that they can demonstrate that their faith is real. As we know, there are some who say, I believe in Jesus, and it's really just kind of a mental assent to some facts. Uh, they haven't experienced the inner transformation that takes place when you wholeheartedly embrace Christ as Savior. That seems to have been the case for those that Paul was writing to and addressing here. Some in the church were falling away from the central teachings of the Christian faith. They hadn't really come to faith in Christ at all. They just, in their minds, agreed to a few facts. Now, in verses 3 through 8, we see here what is considered by most Bible scholars as a quotation from a very early Christian creed that was being taught in the churches. Paul says the truths he shares here are of first importance. So if you want to know what's central to the gospel, you don't have to look any further than here. And this creed says that Christ died for our sins, that he paid the penalty we deserve from God because we are sinners. And it says that dying for our sins is in accordance with the scriptures. That refers to the Old Testament passages, such as Isaiah 52 and 53. A lot of times we know them as speaking of the suffering servant. In verse 4, it says that he was buried. And that verifies that Jesus truly died. And it gives us proof that he rose from the dead. Because if he was buried and the tomb is found empty then that's proof of his resurrection. And then it says, then he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and they testify to the resurrection, of course, and that's also prophesied in the Old Testament in places like Psalm 16 and Psalm 110. And then it goes into some resurrection appearances here, and they include references to those who held authority in the church, like Peter and the disciples. It talks about large groups of people and it, it references Paul himself. Did you notice that the, the phrase, most of whom are alive, is included here? This means that there is incredible proof that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Paul is saying, you question whether Jesus rose from the dead? Come find some of these people. They're still alive. Go ask them about it for yourself. Interview them if you need extra proof. Of course, in verse 8, Paul is referring to Jesus appearing to him on the road to Damascus. And that resulted in, Peter's, or in Paul's conversion. And uh, as we continue with verses 9 through 11, then Paul elaborates on his conversion and what that entailed. He acknowledges that he's inferior to the other apostles because he at one point persecuted the church. But he turns this admission of weakness into an opportunity to magnify God's grace. It's clear by what Paul writes in verse 10 that God's grace did not result in slothfulness on the part of Paul, but tremendous personal effort. He says, I work harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. This provides an excellent example of understanding the Christian life. We do put effort in as we practice spiritual disciplines, as we seek to honor and to serve the Lord, but we do it in a spirit of dependence, knowing that it is God's enabling grace that makes spiritual growth possible. And then in verse 11, Paul reminds the Corinthians that this was 
the very gospel that they once believed. And Paul longs for them to continue believing it. But he's concerned because it seems not all of them were. As this chapter continues from verses 12 to verse 34, Paul makes clear that whether or not you believe in a bodily resurrection brings significant consequences. If you're able, please stand and follow along with me as I read verses 12 through 34. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be mis misrepresenting God because we testify about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, even Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man come de came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at the his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet, but when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. You may be seated. Here's Paul's line of reasoning in verses 12 to 19. He says that if there's no bodily resurrection, then any human, Christ included, having a human body himself, wasn't raised from the dead either. And if that were true, it would have tremendous consequences. First, both the preaching of the apostles and the Corinthians' faith would be useless. You see that in verse 14. Second, no resurrection makes Paul and his companions liars. That's in verse 15. Third, in verse 17, we find that no resurrection makes all humanity stand condemned because of their sins. Fourth, no resurrection means those who have already died, including believers, are eternally lost. We see that in verse 18. And then in verse 19, Paul gives the ultimate consequences if there's no resurrection. He says, that of all the people in the world, Christians are to be pitied if they put their hope only in the things of this life. 
Now that, what he says in verse 19, is a little hard for us Christians in this country today to understand. We might think, certainly there are many benefits to to Christians in knowing Christ and living according to his ways. We might say, well, I've built my life on biblical principles and that's brought tremendous blessings. It's even brought financial blessings to me. But this is where the Christians of Paul's day had a very different experience than we do. Remember, in Paul's day, as it is in many places in the world today, being a Christian meant living a life characterized by sacrifice and suffering. Yes, there was joy, but many had given up families and jobs and friends and homes and even their very lives because of their faith in Christ. If they had done this with no hope of a future resurrection, not only would they not benefit from anything eternal, because that wouldn't be the case, but they would have forfeited the pleasures that this life offers. And they would have done that for nothing. It's for that reason that Paul says, even if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we of all people are most to be pitied. Now Paul doesn't linger on that thought long because he immediately asserts that that's not the case. Look at verse 20. He says, But in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Christ has been raised from the dead, and that has incredible ramifications. Paul uses the Old Testament concept of first fruits here. The first fruits were the first portions of the harvest, and God had determined that the people were to give that portion of the harvest in offering to God. This showed that they trusted the giver, the, I mean, sorry, that the giver of those offerings of the first fruits trusted God to be the one who would give them the entire harvest in the days and weeks to come. The way Paul's using the term here is saying that Christ's resurrection is not an isolated event. It represented just the beginning of something much greater. His resurrection promised the rest of the harvest. And the full harvest of which Christ is the first sign is the harvest of those who have fallen asleep in Christ. The resurrection of those in Christ who have already passed away. In verses 21 and 22, Paul provides a clear connection between Christ's resurrection and that of believers. Adam's sin was more than just a personal transgression. It brought guilt and God's judgment onto all humanity. And since it came through Adam, a man, that death came, it should not be surprising then that the resurrection from the dead also comes through one man. In many passages, including in Romans 5, Paul pointed out that God considered Christ's experience on earth much more than one person's experience. What happened to to Jesus in his death and his resurrection happens to all who are in him through faith. As Paul goes on in verses 24 through and following, he says that the resurrection of believers at the time of Christ's return is just the beginning. Verse 24 tells us that after some unspecified period of time, the end, or as that word is used here, the goal of human history will take place. And from what we know of uh, from other scripture passages, this will be after Christ rules on the earth for a thousand years. And it's at that time that the end or the goal will come that Christ will destroy all that are in opposition to his reign, both human forces and demonic forces. This is written about in Revelation 20, verses 7 to 10, where it mentions Satan being released from prison and deceiving the nations. And and almost immediately after that occurs, God will send fire from heaven to destroy them And he will throw Satan into the lake of fire where he will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's what verse 24 is referencing. Verse 25 is referencing Psalm 110 verse 1. This psalm spoke of great victories that were promised 
to the descendants of David. God had once promised that David's descendants would rule over the entire earth. And that promise now applies to Christ because he is a descendant of David. And so it's necessary in order for this promise to be fulfilled that Christ eventually reigns over everyone and everything. Verse 26 says, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And as Romans 5 so clearly states, Adam introduced death into the human race. But here we find that Christ has come to eliminate death. Now, verses 22 to 28 sound very complicated because of the way Paul words things here. Uh, The New Living Translation kind of smooths things out a bit and makes a little bit more sense of those particular verses. So uh, you can read on the screen uh, silently as I read what these verses say in that translation. I think it'll be a little helpful. Paul wrote, just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. And after that, the end will come when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For the scriptures say, God has put all things under his authority. Of course, when it says all things under his authority, that does not include God himself, who gave Christ his authority. Then, when all things are under his authority, the Son will put himself under God's authority, so that God, who gave his son authority over all things, will be utterly supreme over everything, everywhere. It's a little easier to understand um, with that. Now, as we continue on with verses 29 through 34, Paul goes back to arguing that denying the resurrection is absurd. Verse 29 is one of those Verses that have perplexed Bible scholars for centuries. Apparently, Paul's original audience knew what he was talking about, but it's really hard for anyone who did not live during that time to understand what he's talking about here. There's no mention of being baptized on behalf of the dead anywhere else in the Bible. And so scholars have given all kinds of explanations as to what this could be referring to, and And we can't really be absolutely certain of any explanation. One explanation is that um, Paul was talking about a practice that he did not approve of. He's just stating that this has happened or is happening. Early church fathers alluded to such a practice among second century Gnostic groups in which living people were being baptized on behalf of those who had passed away prior to they themselves being baptized. So this might be some echoes of some earlier thinking that contributed to that Gnostic way of thinking later. Paul doesn't use this occasion to condemn this way of practicing or condone this way of practicing. Instead, his focus here is on pointing out that if the resurrection is not true, then those who are baptizing people on behalf of the dead are contradicting their own theology. Baptizing anyone on behalf of the dead is irrelevant if Christ has not risen from the dead, because that means nobody else is going to rise from the dead either. And then verses 30 to 32, Paul uses a parallel set of arguments from his own experience. First, he says that if there is no resurrection, then the only thing to live for is what you're experiencing in this life. And there's no way that he would preach the gospel if he's just living for this life, Because doing so puts him in danger of being imprisoned and beaten and stoned. It makes no sense to risk his life every day if all he's living for is what there is in this world. And then at the beginning of verse 32, Paul uses figurative language when he talks about fighting with beasts at Ephesus. There's no evidence that he was actually thrown into the arena and fought real beasts. He's 
He's using that as an illustration, a metaphor of the conflict he had with people when he was in Ephesus. And then in the second half of verse 32, Paul cites the most famous slogan of a group of people who rejected any kind of resurrection. And you'll notice that uh, the writer to, uh, of Ecclesiastes also cited this slogan hundreds of years before. Paul says, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. That's the end. Everything just ends with death if, if there's no resurrection. But then Paul immediately rejects such logic. He says, because Christ has been resurrected and there is a resurrection coming for all believers, we must not allow ourselves to be deceived by those who hold such a worldview. In fact, in verse 33, Paul cites a well-known proverb from the Greek poet Menander And he uses it to warn the Corinthians to keep their distance from those who believe such things. He says, bad company ruins good morals. Don't hang around with those people that are rejecting the resurrection. And then in verse 34, Paul calls the Corinthian Christians to come back to their senses. They're to start thinking clearly about the resurrection and stop sinning by letting others convince them that the resurrection isn't true. Now, so far in this chapter, Paul has devoted a lot of time to utterly refute the idea that there is no bodily resurrection of the dead. And we haven't even gotten to the rest of the chapter yet. He's going to come, go on about it, and we'll see that next week. But why does Paul use so much energy and paper and pen and words on this topic because he knows the doctrine is of tremendous importance. He's already made clear that if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ himself couldn't have been raised. And Christ being raised is essential because if he wasn't, then he's not currently alive and sovereign over all creation. And if Christ wasn't raised from the dead, he will not ultimately defeat all who are in opposition to God, including Satan himself. And he hasn't broken the power of death itself. And as we mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then God can't restore all things to their perfect design because no other human will experience resurrection from the dead either. So Paul issues a command to the Corinthians who were denying the resurrection. In verse 34, he says, Wake up! Do not go on sinning by thinking this way. Now, if you're here and you're like I was during my childhood and that you haven't ever been taught this before, then praise the Lord, you finally had the opportunity to wake up to this truth. But there are likely many of us here today who have understood this essential truth for a long time. And our problem isn't that we don't understand this truth or that we somehow oppose this truth in some way. In fact, we would say we wholeheartedly embrace the truth of the resurrection. So the question for us may not be, do we believe it? But rather, do we live like we believe it? Because that can often be an issue for us. In places around the world today where it's dangerous to profess Christ as Lord, this understanding of the resurrection and of Christ conquering Satan and death and God ultimately restoring things to a perfect state is more often in the front of a believer's mind Because they know, like Paul, that if the resurrection isn't true, it is not worth it to suffer like they are in this life. So understanding and embracing this teaching is what motivates them to go on living for Christ, even though it results in much hardship and suffering in this life. Now, We know it's likely that we Christians in the U.S. will face greater opposition to and harder hardship for our faith 
in the years to come. But as of right now, especially in Southwest Virginia, perhaps, it's still pretty easy to be a Christian. And that brings with it a whole other set of problems. We're sometimes so comfortable in this life that we don't think about the life to come very much at all. It doesn't have very much appeal to us because we aren't suffering very much here. If that's the case for you, I'd like to offer you several ways that you can get a more accurate perspective on life. First, if you find yourself being comfortable much of the time, then God may be challenging you to make greater sacrifices in your life for his sake. Do you have a comfortable nest egg you're sitting on? Consider being more sacrificial in your financial giving. Choose to be a little less comfortable financially in order to help bring the gospel to our community and around the world. What incredible rejoicing you'll be able to experience as you hear reports of lives that are being changed, in part because you faithfully gave. How much you'll be able to look forward to the eternal state when you will be able to spend eternity in bodily form with those people that have come to faith because you were faithful in your giving. Or perhaps you're a bit too comfortable because you enjoy a lot of leisure time nowadays. Consider how God may be prompting you to use your time or your energy or your gifts or abilities in service to others. When you pour yourself out in service to others, you get to experience the joy of seeing people be blessed and the joy of knowing that God is pleased with you and the, the joy of knowing that you can push yourselves to the limits here in this life because a life of much better things is coming. So live like you believe the resurrection by being willing to be less comfortable on earth and make greater sacrifices for Christ. Second, live like you believe in the resurrection by recognizing just how much better our eternal existence will be than what we experience in this life. What we need to have is a greater longing for the life to come. Knowing that it is not just some ethereal existence of boredom, but ultimately a restoration of all things. An existence in which we will live with physical bodies in a material world that has been recreated for our delight and pleasure and for God's glory. Now I'd like you to take back out of your memory what I had you think of at the beginning of this sermon. What were some of those experiences that you had that brought you joy because you have a physical body and were able to partake in them. Consider this. Your experience with your body in the next life will be exponentially better than even the best experience in this life. So recapture that understanding that the life to come is so much better than anything we can experience here in this life that will help us long for the life to come as we should. And it will equip us to be able to face the suffering that we inevitably encounter in this life, whether it be suffering that's the result of simply living in these bodies that are prone to illness and death, or suffering that comes as the result of sinful actions of others, or suffering that's the result of persecution for our faith that may, in fact, be coming. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for making so plain the incredible hope that there is, not just in some ethereal existence in which we live apart from our bodies. We, we know that that takes place temporarily for those who are in Christ. But, Father, thank you that we have the restoration of all things to look forward to, including our physical bodies in which we will live in a material world that is perfect as was the world you originally designed. 
Father, there are those of us here today that are far too comfortable in this life. We don't feel compelled to think about and be motivated by the life to come. Convict us of our sin of slothfulness or our sin of, of just settling in and making too much for ourselves a heaven on earth. Give us the inward motivation we need to pour ourselves out in service to others, investing in your kingdom through our time and our efforts and our abilities and spiritual gifts and our financial giving. And Father, if there are any here today that don't understand what it means to have this assurance of eternal life and physical bodies in a material world, would you work in their hearts and give them an unsettled spirit until they come to recognize their need to embrace Christ as the Savior, knowing they could do nothing to rid themselves of the sin that is upon them. Help us as a church family to make that clear to all those we come in contact with within this body and outside these walls in the community. Give us that hope that we share with others. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. We'll have the children come up and be dismissed to their playtime. And we invite the rest of you to fellowship with one another and join us for Sunday school at 10 after 11. Thank you.